All right, so this subject has so many different directions that really need to be addressed uh, regarding Israel and the church. And uh, I, I'm, I'm trying to slow down because it's hard to keep up, right? I, I know that there's a lot of catching up to do that. I've, I'm, the last message I did was 72 minutes and people are it's like, oh my gosh, you know, but I just feel burdened to keep pressing on with this. Um, and again, this is based on a community post on my wall, but I'm going in different places uh, as questions come up and as my own burden leads um, to talk about things that are important. Um, again, though, what we're contending for is what is the rule of the Christian life? We are not making distinctions for distinction's sake. We're talking about how do we walk as believers? And these issues have real impact on what uh, what governs our conscience? What, and how confidently can we stand before the Lord? Right? Um, the next thing we were going to talk about, we talked about how confusing the church with Israel has real implications for our understanding of service and reward. Um, those who believe, well, we, we talked about how, look, our rule of life is not Moses and the Sermon on the Mount, which is the same thing. We're not under the law. We're not under the oldness of the letter. We are... Uh, beneficiaries of the ministry of the spirit which gives life and that ministry operates through the gospel not just at the beginning of the christian life but the entirety of the christian life is sustained and nourished and fed by the gospel which tells us about who we are in christ and it's every ounce of growth in the christian life is a matter of satisfying our conscience before God with the gospel so that we stand upright and confident. And the gospel takes burdens off of us and puts them on Christ and frees us to stand as joint heirs with Jesus Christ, rejoicing before God, and it gives us joy and peace. Uh, not because of anything we've done, but because of the work of Jesus Christ. And all we're doing here is holding on to our crown. And not letting anyone steal it, right? So it really is a different position to be in when you understand the rule of life for the Christian is not the law or any set of instructions per se. It's the gospel. But you can't fully appreciate that without, uh, I mean, you can believe me because I tell you, but then when you're in the word yourself and you stumble across passages and you don't know where they fit into God's overall plan, that's when you need to have the ability to distinguish and, and know where things fit and have a, a, a work, be a workman that need uh, not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, right? And uh, this is where seeing, okay, well, what was Jesus talking about in the Synoptic Gospels? And why is it that David Benjamin or, or any of these people can say that the Sermon on the Mount isn't the instructions for our Christian life, but Romans 6 through 8 is? What, what authority do they have to say that? Are they just making that up? You know, you need to be sure that we don't get that from ourselves, but Paul told us where his ministry came from. You know, his ministry came from the ascended Christ. Uh, and it's his ministry, really, the be, that, that began, and, and then the apostles after him, John and Peter, but uh, he's the one who started really delineating. Okay, there's a difference between the old and new. And Christ did come as a minister to the circumcision to confirm the promises to the fathers. But there's a mystery. Israel as a branch has been cut off and they've been partially blinded and now God has turned to the Gentiles and while he's turned to the Gentiles there's this new thing called the body of Christ which was a mystery and there's a revelation of this mystery which has become a mystery a ministry for the stewards and this ministry is a distribution of an inheritance and it's all the riches of Christ 
what he's accomplished and secured for us. Uh, and we are not here ministering the letter to tell you what to do. We're here dispensing Christ and Christ is becoming life in you. And he's your food and he's your drink and he's your nourishment and he's your satisfaction and your supply because he's in you now. And when he was in the when he was teaching in the Sermon on the Mount in the Synoptic Gospels, he was not in the people. Right? I mean that's an obvious distinction right there. When Paul wrote his epistles, the ascended Christ was the spirit dwelling in the body. So the recipients of the letter that Paul wrote that was given to him by revelation, his doctrine was given to him by the ascended Christ by revelation. The recipients of that revelation, the ones it was intended for, had Christ dwelling on the inside of them. And the content of that revelation was about the Christ that dwelled inside of them and how he works and what he's doing. Whereas the synoptic gospels and the law of Moses and everything that went before, well, let's say the, go the gospel specifically, you had Jesus on the earth speaking to crowds of people who existed independently of him. That right there is the difference, the primary difference. And could he talk to them about his life in them? No. All he could do is say, you are in the flesh and your destination is either me or the lake of fire. They had not made it to him yet. <laughs> uh, they needed to believe in him and then he needed to go do a strange work apart from them that they could not follow him to. You know, in the Synoptic Gospels, if you read about what he said concerning discipleship, especially Luke, you'll see it's impossible. That was his point. You know, when it talked about discipleship, he said, look, you need to count the cost because what king, having 10,000 troops, ha is going to have an army coming at him with 20,000 troops and is going to go out to war? No, you're going to send an envoy and seek terms of peace. Likewise, if you don't forsake all you have, you can't be my disciple, meaning your 10,000 troops are not enough. You need to find another way. And in every single case where Jesus spoke of discipleship in the Synoptic Gospels following him, he made it clear that you couldn't do it. All right? And then and, and discipleship meant following him and taking up your cross. And the cross is not just suffering, cross is death. So to follow Jesus means to die. Well, death is the end of my ability to do anything. And that's his revelation of discipleship. Right, um, you know, if you if you talk about discipleship and you don't talk about the death of Christ and your death, then you're not talking about discipleship. A lot of people try to talk about the cross as if it means virtues. No, the cross is not virtuous. The cross is a scandal. Uh, it's the foolishness of God. It's the weakness of God, and yet it's the strength and the wisdom of God hidden in that foolishness and weakness. Right, but. Finally, in John, he told the disciples, the only ones who followed him, you know, that he got down to 12 because when he told the crowds, unless you eat my blood and drink my flesh, you have no life in you. And they all said, that's it. And they left him. He lost the crowds in John 6. That was in the last week of his life. And the apostles didn't leave. And he said, what? These words are hard, but and they said, these hard words are hard. He said, my word is spirit and his life. The flesh profits nothing. And he said, are you going to leave me too? And they said, Lord, where are we going to go? You have the words of eternal life. And they followed him, right? But then in John 14 he, and 13, he said, look, I'm going to the Father. And where I go, you cannot follow. And now sorrow has filled your heart. Because for three years, they kept saying, we give everything to follow you. Even, even at that point, Peter said, what are you talking about? I give everything to follow you. I'll follow you to the end. Jesus said, you'll deny me three times before the cock throw close, uh, clucks, right? Crows. <laughs> uh, and Jesus made it clear that even those who followed him to the end couldn't follow him. Why? Because where he was going, only the high priest could go. They couldn't go past the veil 
They'd gotten up to the edge of the veil in the holy place, but that veil into the holiest where God is, the Father, is the flesh of Jesus Christ, according to Hebrews. Hebrews says that he entered in through his the veil, that is his flesh, once for all, uh, to obtain eternal redemption. He had to go in by himself. Nobody could follow Jesus Christ as a disciple where he went. So only his death was sufficient. They could have all died. None of them would have entered into the holiest. Only Christ. But then he said... Okay, sorrow fills your heart, and yet none of you are asking where I'm going. And they said, well, where, you haven't told us where you're going or to show us the way or anything. Said, well, I am the true way. I am the truth. I am the life. I'm going to the Father. They said, show us the Father, and it's sufficient to us. Well, haven't you known that when you see me, you've seen the Father? Don't you believe that the Father is in me and I am in him? Uh, and he says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I'm going to come and receive you to myself, that where I am you may be. And he was explaining to them that the union he has with the Father, he's going to make available to them. And in John, at the end of John 14, he says, I'm going to send the Spirit. He says, you sorrow now because I'm going away, but I'm going to come and you'll see me. And the world won't see me. And you'll rejoice because you do see me. And they said, well, how are we going to see you in a way that the world can't see you? And he said, I'm going to send the Spirit, even the tr Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, but you know him and he's with you and will be in you. And he said, I will not leave you orphans, but I will come to you. And he's talking about the Spirit of Sonship that we have received now that he has gone through death and resurrection. And he said, in that day you will see me. How do we see him? As our life. Then in John 15, he talks about discipleship, a new kind of discipleship, which is abide in me and I in you. And that kind of discipleship is not take up your cross and you don't have enough and uh, you can't do it and you can't follow me, but it is I am the word in you now and I bear my fruit. And if that which remain, if that which you heard from the beginning abides in you, you'll also continue in the Father and in the Son. And the job of that word is to produce confidence that you are accepted in the Beloved because I've done everything you couldn't do. Christ did everything we couldn't do. He accomplished all the demands of discipleship for us in our place. And now he comes to us as that life and he's accepted of the Father in our place. And we saw that the other day that, you know, his blood is accepted as the price for our failure. And his fragrance, the fat portion, goes up as a sweet savor to God that causes God to draw near. And we're accepted in the Beloved as one, as the Beloved. He delights in us. The Father delights in us. And we are allowed now to draw near. The veil has been opened. And we have confident access by faith through Jesus Christ. Okay? And there's nothing in the way between us and God. And the whole relationship has changed. And it's no longer if you don't forgive, the Father won't forgive you. Right? It is forgive one another as God in Christ's sake has for Christ's sake has forgiven you. You've already received everything. You're an heir. And there's no qualification for you to receive it other than you believed in Christ and you've been baptized into him and you have redemption, you have forgiveness of sins, you have passed out of darkness, you are in the light, you have received everything. You've been seated in the heavenlies with Christ, you're complete in him. There's nothing in your way. And there's no obstacles or conditions that can be added after the fact to nullify your position or to disqualify you or to hinder you. Okay, that's the position we read from when we're reading in the epistles. Now, if you don't understand that fundamental change that's taken place, and even as a believer, you go back and you read the Synoptic Gospels, not making those kind of distinctions, which is what 99% of Christians, even the pastors, do. If you go to the average institutional church, 
you will find that eventually they're going to get to the Sermon on the Mount. And they're going to try to teach you. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the humble. All these different things uh, that are fine and beautiful and good, but it's law. And they'll try to even mingle it with Romans 6. You know, if we could just deny our flesh, we'd be this way. Uh, <laughs> but they cannot do deal with when Jesus says, if your eye offends, you pluck it out. It's better to enter into life maimed than to be cast whole into the lake of fire. They have to lighten that one and soften it and say, well, he's speaking allegorical there. He's just saying, no, he's not speaking allegorically there. He's saying, if you lust in your heart, you've committed adultery and you're guilty. And it, you are going to the lake of fire if you don't have him. And none of those crowds had him at that point because he had not given up his, uh, he had not given himself up. You know, he had not died and been resurrected. Now, some of them were justified by faith. They believed, but he still needed to do the work, right? And many of them rejected him. The same ones that were in the crowd listening to him that day were in the crowd later saying, crucify him, give us Barabbas. We have no king but Caesar. And they needed to eventually come to believe the gospel, right? Uh, and when they did, they became heirs and needed to learn new truth. See, once, once you're an heir and you're in the body of Christ, now you're in a different position. You are no longer outside of Jesus listening to him tell you about your need for him because you're condemned. Like Paul said, the law was not for the righteous, but for the ungodly and the sinner. And the law is good if it's used lawfully, knowing that it's not for the righteous, but for the ungodly and the sinner. But the Christians get confused when they don't rightly divide, and they try to use the law to reteach Christians the wrong things, as if Christ is outside of them, as if they're not complete in Christ, okay? They go back to the Synoptic Gospels, uh, or... Moses and the Psalms, and now those places are beneficial to us if we understand who we are in Christ. But if we don't have our armor on, and I always say, look, the way to read the gospel, read the Bible is to preach the gospel to yourself first, acknowledge who you are in Christ, and then interpret every verse that you encounter in light of that truth. So you can't come to a verse in Matthew that undoes, you can't come to a verse that the... Uh, uh, the earthly Jesus prior to his death and resurrection says to someone in Israel uh, that undermines or counteracts or contradicts what the ascended, glorified, enthroned Christ who is seated at the right hand of God after made purification of sins has said to you after he baptized you into his body, baptized you into his death, freed you from the law, made you an heir and seated you at his right hand in, in the heavenly places. Uh, when he gave you that gospel, the law can't undermine it or contradict it. And so when you go back and read, pluck your eye out, uh, if it offends you, better to enter into life maimed um, than to have your whole body thrown into the lake of fire as a Christian, you're, you've got to hold on to the gospel. And a lot of people say, no, this is Jesus talking. That's in red letters. I'm a red letter Christian. And so they go back into fear and trembling and think, I lost it in my heart today. Maybe I'm not saved or maybe I can lose my salvation. Right? Because they don't see these distinctions. And these distinctions produce, they do produce arguments. It is true that distinctions produce arguments. And a lot of the evangelical people will say, well, then you shouldn't be talking about them. And they'll say, we just need to be like, you know, babes and you didn't need to be a theologian to be saved. Actually, that's not true. Everybody is a theologian. Everybody has a theology. What is your theology? It's what you think about who God is. Everybody's a theologian. But there is the doctrine of Christ, and there's the doctrine of devils. You've either received the doctrines of devils and you believe them from the world, or you believe the doctrines of Christ from the, from the renewing of your mind from the word. 
you're feeding on something, you know. Uh, the Bible doesn't tell us to be ignorant. It says, for the lack of knowledge, my people perish. And actually, you know, what happens is, as we start discussing these things, then the fights break out because people say, no, uh, I am righteous by the law and you're just looking for a license to sin or whatever. So we have to block them. And then they say, he blocked me and hurt my feelings. He's not walking in love. They'll go to an evangelist and say that. Evangelist has a very loving heart and will say, well, that's not walking in love. That's terrible. You know, what a cold hearted person. This isn't how we should treat the world. And then we're rebuked for making all these divisions, you know. But no, uh, we have to make these distinctions for anybody to grow. And in fact, it's the distinctions that help people get saved. Because Christianity is the laughing stock of the world. Christianity is the reason people, in a lot of cases, don't, you know, they cause the Gentiles to blaspheme. For many years, at least, one of the excuses I used to not get saved was the ridiculousness of the Christians. And what actually helped me get saved was meeting someone who could actually break through all the nonsense and say, no, this is what the Bible actually says. And I could see that there was a difference between Christians who actually read their Bible and were reasonable uh, and had wisdom and understanding and could speak the truth and those who just clung to their superstitions and traditions. It was real clear. To me, even as an unbeliever, I could see the difference between someone who spoke with authority and the, the religious people. I, I watched it. Uh, as someone I knew who knew the prophetic word and knew these dis kind of distinctions had to contend for the truth uh, in the face of religious people. And that's when I started to see, okay, the f that garbage Christianity that I saw, uh, that was not, that was the devil's lie. That wasn't the real thing. You know, we need to show them that no, what you're seeing out there is not the real thing. Uh, there is a difference, and there's people willing to contend for it, you know. So we do have to keep making these distinctions, not only for the world's sake, but, it, but the gospel goes in-house first, right? Even the gospel went to the Jews first and then also to the Greek. It goes to the lost sheep of the house of Israel first. God always reaches his people because if he can reach his people, then he's got vessels he can use to reach others. You can't reach the lost if the people who reach the lost aren't solid on the truth. So of course we had to keep teaching and making these distinctions. And we also do have to shut down people who come and, uh, you know, lie and twist our words and spout a bunch of heresy on our walls and stuff like that. So, no, it's not hard-hearted. We just, we just keep pressing on with the truth here, right? So, but the next point in the thing, you know, I'm talking about conscience. Why are we doing all this? with Israel and the church is because it comes down to a matter of conscience. I got an email yesterday or a comment about conscience with someone who was saved, but he had all kinds of questions and he had all these verses that were making him question, uh, can you lose your salvation or, you know, and it was the ones like that. Um, better to uh, pluck out your eye and enter the kingdom maimed than, uh, be thrown whole into the lake of fire and my only the only way you can answer that is to make to uh in a way that actually satisfies the conscience is these kind of distinctions otherwise he's going to just find a bunch of other verses until he learns to see where he stands and distinguish it from everything else and learn how to divide the word himself uh you know uh, no matter how many questions I answer, I'm not giving him the tools um, to study the word himself and and put the armor on. He's got to put the armor on himself. Like I said, we, when we come to the word, we have to put the armor on. We have to learn to put the armor on. So this is equipping the saints. We have to equip. Uh, okay, so I said that people have gone before would have had no understanding of the kind of language we use in the New Testament household in this ministry, you know, caring about my body, the dying of the Lord Jesus, and I've been crucified with Christ, and nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ in me. Those are all things that have become 
real to us because Christ is now in us. And there is a set of speaking that matches us. And that speaking is in the epistles because it is Christ who is from the throne speaking through the church to the church who has this Christ in them. And the topic of the ascended Christ speaking to his church is what? The mystery of Christ, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And this was a mystery that Paul said was not revealed to the prophets and the apostles, uh, men before. Uh, uh, but it was a dispensation that was given to him to complete the word of God. Here, let's look at that real quick. I don't think I'm making this up. Um, Colossians uh, 1. Uh, 26. Sorry. He says, uh, where if I was, I was made a minister of the church. He said, I fill up on my part, that which is behind the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. David would have never said anything like that. Abraham could have never said anything like that. That's language that belongs to the body of Christ. That's unique to this age. No one in the millennium is ever going to say, I'm filling up in my part that which is of lacking of the afflictions of Christ for his body's sake. As we partake of the sufferings, we'll also partake of the glory. There is a fellow partaking of the sufferings of Christ in this age related to ministry that is something unique to this age that wasn't in any other. Okay, uh, But he says, of which, the church, I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which was given to me for you to complete or fulfill the word of God, even the mystery, which has been hid from the ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach, warning every man, teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect or full grown in Christ. Whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. Now, that dispensation is the same thing he was talking about in Ephesians 3, when he said uh, that you might understand the dispensation of the grace of God given to me for the Gentiles, how he made known to me the revelation of the mystery. And it does say that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs with the... Uh, uh, hold on. I'll read it. Which in other ages, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge of the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, but is now revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of the promise of in Christ by the gospel, of which I was made a minister. Now he says that this is the dispensation, if you heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me towards you, how by revelation he made known to me the mystery. He says it's that we should be fellow heirs with Israel. Uh, what well says that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body. Actually, it doesn't mention Israel here. We, we insert that because we've been told by so many people that what the mystery is, is that Gentiles partake with Israel and are part of Israel. No, the dispensation to complete the word of God, the mystery that was hidden from the ages and now revealed to the saints is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And here he says it's that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and partakers of the promise in Christ. What promise and what inheritance? Well, as we've been seeing, especially in our everlasting covenant stuff, and throughout this study as well, it's the it's the the promises that God made to the seed of David and the seed of Abraham, which is Christ himself, we've been baptized into him and we have become members of his body, part of the new creation, the new man, in which there's neither Jew or Greek, male or female, bond or free, but Christ is all and in all. And we are the vessel through which he will fill all things and inherit all things. And we have been raised up and seated with him in the heavenlies. And when Jesus on the earth was speaking to the crowds, there was no hint that such a group of people even existed because it was a mystery, right? We have to, I mean, we have to 
beat this into our heads and see it again and again and again so that we set up a permanent benchmark in our mind and in the scripture like a bookmark where when I go back to the synoptic gospels I remember again and again and again he's the church is not here okay and and that also affects that so that is how I take my cues about what do I do with a verse where it says better to pluck off your eye or cut off your hand and enter the kingdom maimed than to be thrown entirely into the lake of fire. If you think the Sermon on the Mount is for Christians, then the only way you can handle that verse is to weaken it and say, well, he's just speaking allegorically. He doesn't really mean that. No, he said, if I lust in my heart, I'm committed in adultery. And that's the, you know, that puts me in danger of hell. If I hate my brother, I've committed murder. John says, whoever is a hate his brother doesn't have eternal life and is a murderer. What am I going to do? Well, first John is talking about a specific kind of hatred. It's the way of Cain, which is a rejection of the offering of Christ that Abel offered, the fat portion of the blood. We've talked about that. Uh, but again, Jesus is talking, he's using the law lawfully to tell the unrighteous they need the gospel. It concludes, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, you shall by no means enter. And he tells them they can't enter. On their own righteousness, they cannot enter. They need another righteousness. Who is that other righteousness? What is that other righteousness? Some of them already understood. The just shall live by faith. Uh, but the Pharisees couldn't understand, and he spoke in a way that they wouldn't understand, lest they turn and be healed and converted. He spoke, he, he, a lot of people think that Jesus spoke parables to be clear, but actually he spoke parables to hide truth from the proud so that they wouldn't understand, so that seeing they wouldn't see, hearing they wouldn't hear, lest they be, uh, turn and be converted. It was actually a judgment that he spoke mysteriously to the self-righteous they could not understand when jesus spoke those who already knew the shepherd's voice and knew god uh you know and had some training that i have you know like mary look at mary and joseph uh and and uh elizabeth and john the baptist's dad zechariah their expectation was from the scriptures. When they found out that Jesus was going to be born, or that John the Baptist was going to be the prophet that would go before his face, the first thing that out of their mouth was, this is the one who is going to save us from our sins. Or Simeon in the temple, who uh, the Jesus was presented to him on the eighth day out of his circumcision, this old man, and he said, now my eyes have seen the salvation of the Lord. This is one who's going to save us from our sins. They're standing in the temple where all the sacrifices and Aaronic priesthood are being done. The Pharisees believed that sins were taken care of by the priesthood and that their own righteousness was enough and being connected to Abraham was enough that the kingdom should be theirs and they were going to kill the heir, Christ. But there was another kind of people and Jesus said, those who seek the glory of God will know if the doctrine is true. And that's like the people like that followed Jesus who understood they were sinners in need of a Savior. They'd already been taught by the law and their conscience and the prophets. And they knew what it meant that Jesus was the son of David. When uh, Peter introduced Andrew to him, he said, or was it Nathaniel? He said, look, come and see. Uh, I found the one who Moses and the prophets spoke of. They knew that this man from Nazareth was the one who was going to save them from their sins. That's what they cared about. Whereas, you know, the Pharisees sometimes wondered if he was the Christ. And in their mind, there was like, was well, he a political figure that's going to, you know, save us from the Romans and establish the kingdom? If not, if he is, let's get this campaign started, you know? They didn't understand their need for a savior from their sins. And Christians today in name who go back to the Sermon on the Mount and read it as if it's the rule of life for a Christian. 
Also, don't tremble at it. The way God's righteous people have always trembled at that thing. You know, when you read the saints in church history who trembled at that thing, that you'll see that they believed the Sermon on the Mount was the scariest sermon ever preached. And yet, you can go to an institutional church and they'll, they'll make Sunday school stuff out of it with coloring books and all kinds of stuff as if it's just, you know, it's sort of like the flood of Noah, you know. Ken Ham does a museum where you got a zip line and a gift shop and it's like, you know, you wouldn't do that with Auschwitz. You wouldn't do a, you know, zip line through a bottle of Auschwitz. And, and, and <laughs> the judgment uh, represented by the Noah, Ark of Noah, I mean, the flood and what that actually represents is so heavy. It's just our conscience, we, we make light of things that we don't, if our conscience is not ringing. And so they used to say that the law is like a hammer. And that song, you know, Amazing Grace, it was grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved. That's the kind of person that God is working on. And that's also the kind of person that benefits from these distinctions. These distinctions are a healing balm to the conscience of someone who's a bruised reed. And when he reads the Bible, he needs to know who he is and where he stands so that he can safely read Matthew, Mark, and Luke without thinking every time he hits these passages that he's going to be losing his salvation, right? That's why we make these distinctions. <laughs> uh, but no, the mystery that has now been revealed and the food for the church is from the ascended Christ to the church in whom he dwells. And the topic of his conversation is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So the topic has changed. The Jesus speaking on the Sermon on the Mount to the crowds outside of him, all he could talk to them about was the law and the gospel. And the gospel was not fully revealed because he still needed to do, do his work. You know, but those who had an intuitive grasp in there and had been taught in their conscience, they knew. Uh, this is the son of David. He's going to save us from our sins. Maybe they didn't quite get the whole thing, but... Mary Magdalene did. She knew. She when she put the uh, she broke open the alabaster box, poured it on his feet, wiped his feet with her tears. <clears throat> he said, "She does this for my burial." She understood his death and resurrection and what it meant. That's why she was weeping. She knew the she knew what the prophet said, and she had she understood the prophetic testimony of Christ. It's all there in the scriptures, and they should have known. Uh, Okay, so our spirituality is not the Sermon on the Mount of the Law of Moses. And yeah, that's something worth contending for, even if people get offended. <laughs> okay, but then, um, now it is true that all saints were always justified by faith. And justified is the way we're qualified to be inheritors of whatever it is God set aside for us. Abraham was justified by faith. He believed God and it was reckoned to him for righteousness. And according to Romans, that's what made him an heir of the world to come. Um, however, there are different portions uh, enjoyed at different times depending on where God is in his move. And we saw in the last message that there's an earthly and a heavenly branch, right? And the church's portion is heavenly. It's Christ himself, at least in this age and in the millennium. Uh, and Israel's portion really is earthly. And that has not been allegorized to become heavenly. When G when, and we're going to talk about that probably in the next message, but we're, we're going to have to go visit Ezekiel and stuff. But when God talks about bringing them back into their land and sanctifying them before the nations, and then ruling over the nations. He's not talking about the Gentile parts of the church, uh, and he's not talking about heaven. He's talking about literally what he's going to do on the earth when he establishes the throne, which, uh, the, and I'm only going to touch on this for a second, but uh, and we're going to be skipping around here, but confusing the church with Israel has real implications for our understanding of service and reward. Uh, those who believe we're Israel tend to conflate the church's judgment seat, for example, with the sheep and goat nation's judgment seat, 
when the Lord establishes the Davidic throne in Matthew 25. Not seeing the distinction between Israel and the church will lead to not distinguishing between what we call the Bema reward celebration that happens when we meet the Lord in the air when we're glorified and the judgment of the nations or the judgment of the servants in the parables in the Synoptic Gospels. And this is where Christians, so-called ministers, get the idea that there might be a whipping post in the day of Christ where servants of the Lord in this age are actually scourged in front of the church for failures related to service. They're actually beaten. Uh, Gene Kim teaches that. There, I, I was with a church that taught that. There's a lot of people that teach that. Well, what do you think that that does to the conscience of believers who are supposed, they know they're supposed to be looking forward to the rapture, but they're terrified of it because they're afraid that in that day, their life is going to be inspected and they're going to be beaten. <laughs> uh, this failure to distinguish between the church's reward and the judgment of the servants and nations has led to serious gospel problems. And wolves, such as John MacArthur, have used it to absolutely decimate and shipwreck the conscience of many believers. And this also leads to tragic misunderstandings of what the nature of ministry actually is. And we'll have to talk about that in another message. But, uh, you know, there's three different judgment seats. But if you allegorize away Israel, they, the distinctions dissolve and it all becomes one judgment seat. And this is what Francis Chan and... David Platt and John MacArthur and the Catholics, and many do, most amillennialists will do, is that they believe that there's one judgment seat, the great white throne judgment, where the quick and the dead are judged according to their works. Uh, and they believe the church is there and the nations are the, you know, the unsaved. But, and so then when they read Matthew 7, the end of the parable, I'm sorry, the end of the Sermon on the Mount, where he says, every idle word that you speak, you'll give an account in the day of judgment. Okay? Then they read Matthew 24 and 25, sorry, 25, which is the, called the judgment of the sheep and goats nations. And he says, I was hungry and you didn't feed me. I was naked, you didn't clothe me. And I was uh, in prison, you didn't visit me. And he cast them into the lake of fire. Those are called the goats. Okay, so every word I say, and if I don't do enough good works, even if I'm a believer, in that day, I'm gonna be judged according to those things and I may still be found unworthy. And then at the great white throne judgment, they assume that's where that all happens and then everybody's thrown into the lake of fire. Even the ones who might've thought they were believers. And they're, they're found out to be not true believers. Maybe they didn't really believe the gospel. Maybe their faith was a what John MacArthur calls a spurious faith. Or maybe it was a dead faith. Faith without works is dead. Even the demons believe and tremble. And so they grab those verses from James, and they, they use this to launch attacks on the conscience of the body of Christ. Well, what's the answer to this? The answer is learning to distinguish. There's not three, uh, there's not one judgment seat, there's three. Uh, the one in Matthew... Uh, seven, I really do believe, refers most likely to the great white throne. And that one is at the end of the book of Revelation, the second resurrection, when all the dead from every age who did not believe in Christ are raised up to be judged according to their works because they didn't believe in the gospel. And their own conscience will bear record to what every word they said and every thought to show that they didn't keep the law, they were not righteous. And not only that, but they'll manifest themselves as blasphemers against God because they're going to go into the darkness weeping and gnashing their teeth. And the gnashing of the teeth there is, is anger. It's rage and curses against God. Their hatred is going to be revealed. The carnal God mind is hostile against God, cannot be subjected to him. They're children of wrath by nature. And even though they were able to pretend to be nice people during their time on earth, secretly down underneath it all, that social veneer hid a deep-seated hatred and rejection of God that's going to be revealed in that day when all the secrets of men's heart are revealed. Okay, That's the great white throne judgment at the end, and it's part of the second resurrection. But then there's the first resurrection, which actually is not one event, but it includes several different events uh, and a couple different groups of people. But it's, it's really one group that has a different timings. And there are... 
there is one group that gets raised up into the air to meet the Lord. And there's one group that's on the earth at the time that happens and is caught up together with them. That's the church. We who, uh, those who are dead in Christ are caught up to meet him. And we who are alive and remain are caught up with them instantly to meet them. And we're changed. And we put on incorruptibility. We're conformed to the image of Christ and glorified. And we meet the Lord in the air in secret. And that's called the rapture or the resurrection of the church. At the same time or approximately the same time, the graves in Israel, I believe, are going to be opened. Or it could be a little later. I mean, it's it's considered part of the first resurrection. But there are earthly graves that will be opened uh, at that time in Israel. And there will be people who longed for the kingdom who knew that they would be resurrected to inherit the land. And that's why, for example, Joseph commanded his bones to be buried, even though he died in Egypt. By faith, he commanded his bones to be taken back to Israel, uh, or to Canaan, to be buried, because he knew he was going to be resurrected into the land. And we'll talk about all that when we get to Ezekiel 36 and 37, because he literally describes that. He's going to do it in front of all the nations. He's going to glorify his name by doing some pretty mighty supernatural works. Um, Okay, but there will also be a gathering of God's believers at that time that he will go forth, Jesus Christ will go forth from Zion to deliver, regrafted in Israel at that time, from the nations that are gathered to destroy them uh, under the Antichrist. Now, some have asked me, okay, what about Jews that have gotten say that believe during the Holocaust? Are they Israel? No, they're part of the church. If if you are a Jewish person and you have believed in the last two thousand years, you're not part of the Isra- branch of Israel. That was cut off. You're part of uh, the church, member of the body of Christ. Your rights or your identity of circumcision and all that has been counted as dung. Uh, you know, anything according to the flesh is reckoned dead. You've been made alive together with Christ. You've been made part of the new man in which there's no Jew or Greek. Um, and you have a different kind of destiny. But, at the time of the tribulation, with the sealing of the 144,000, there's a little grafting in of a believing remnant of Israel, that's true Israel, uh, that will be the servants of God during that time. And will go forth to inherit the land. Uh, God will work that out. And, you know, this is getting long, so we don't have time to talk about all that. But the point is, at that time when he sets up the kingdom, he's going to gather the sheep and goat nations. Now, this is the judgment in Matthew 25. And the sheep and goat nations has to do with the distribution of position in the millennial kingdom among the nations that survive based on their treatment of the Jewish people during the tribulation. Uh, You know, and the Christians. So during that time, you're going to either be getting saved or you're going to be part of the Antichrist system. (laughs) And the goats will be part of the Antichrist system and they are all going to be thrown into the lake of fire. They're going to have taken the mark of the beast and they're also going to have been um, persecuting the saints. But the sheep will be those who had, who most likely gave aid to believers who were seeking refuge because they couldn't buy or sell. And they themselves were believers. Uh, and you can trace that down in the scriptures because when Jesus sent the 70 out two by two, there's, uh, that was the beginning of a ministry that hasn't yet finished. There, he said, you know, you won't have gone to all the cities until the Son of Man comes. And he gave him specific instructions. You know, if your peace does not, uh, if your peace stays with you, let it be on that house. If they don't receive you, wipe the dust off your feet. And the judge, the, uh, it'll be better for that city, or it'll be better than so- for Sodom and Gomorrah than for that city in the day of judgment. And then he says, I tell you, the, the coming of the Son of Man 
you won't have gone to all the cities until the Son, Son of Man comes. I'm totally butchering it. But there's, uh, it's clear that he was sending them out, the 70, in seed form. And that was a prototype of the sending out of the 144,000 during the tribulation. And they're going to go out to all the cities. And they're going to be, they're going to have nothing. No, they're not bringing money with them. They're not bringing anything. They're going to need refuge wherever they go. And those who receive them will have also received the gospel, proving their sheep. And those who do not, they're going to wipe the dust off their feet and leave that city. And that city was, will be marked for judgment. Uh, that's how the tribulation is going to go. Everybody's going to hear the gospel in the tribulation. And there are going to be many people that accept it, many people that are going to uh, reject it. And the sheep and the goat nation judgment is going to be related to some of that. That has nothing to do with the church. But if you, can, if you don't understand the prophetic plan and you just think that's for the Bible geeks, not worthy to make these distinctions because you're confusing people, you know, and, uh, then when you read those passages, what choice do you have but to try to apply it to our Christian life? How many times have we taught... The Bible doesn't mean anything until you apply it to your Christian life. You know, well, I'm gonna read Matthew 25 and apply it to my Christian life. What does it mean that I'm a virgin with no oil? Well, I'll be in the outer darkness, weeping and gnashing my teeth. Oh my God! <laughs> That's what happens. You better be sure who you are in Christ. Are you a virgin in that parable? No. The virgins are the friends of the bridegroom, children of the bride chamber. The, uh, they are not the bride herself. She's not in that parable. She's a mystery not yet being revealed. Settle it in your mind that the church is not being addressed in uh, Matthew 24 and 25. It will put your... It, it's not just an interesting point of prophecy. It is for your conscience to put you at rest. We can stand joyfully before the Lord, uh, especially once we understand that our judgment seat is not an inspection of our life. That's under the blood. Our judgment is a Bema seat reward celebration like the uh, Olympic game passing out of medals. And we'll have to talk about that another time. Now I have a whole playlist called the Bema seat. That Christ is our reward. And he wants us to understand that he's our righteousness, our sanctification, and our reward in that order so that we can have confidence in the day of Christ. He's coming very soon. And he wants us to be bold, confident, and rejoicing. And you know what? People who are bold, confident, and rejoicing are the ones that are going to be a good witness to the lost. But it's only if they are fed well and know how to rightly divide and aren't falling into a pit every time they read the Bible. And then they can't go anywhere because, uh, it, you know... If they try to bring these points up, they're told, hey, you know, you're just causing arguments and causing division to get out of here. They can't go to churches and get these questions answered. You know, they have to come to YouTube. And thank God he's raised some people up who can spend the time going through the tedium. You know, the problem is, is like you do a message like this. People ask a genuine question and you can hear the snoring halfway through. You know, the ones who accuse us have never gotten to actually hear our answers because they can't stay awake through the answer. And I'm sorry for that. I don't know of a way to shortly give you the answer. It's not a matter of just throwing one or two Bible verses at you. These are big topics. Uh, okay, well, have a good day. I'll talk to you later.